I will end it, I tell myself, poised at the edge of the overpass. I watch the traffic below, a river of white light coming toward me, a river of red taillights flowing away like blood behind, a rushing maelstrom of certain death. A feeling of relief washes over me as my feet leave the concrete, turbulent, exhaust-scented air rushing past my cheeks. I fall, and the river of white reaches up to embrace me. It began online, an advertisement, I said to myself, looking at the unfamiliar address, a string of letters and numbers. But the title, I'm Coming, is unusual. Maybe a pervert, I speculate. I open the mail. I'm coming, says the mail. Nothing more. I send a reply. Who the hell is this? Minutes later, unknown address. My mail returns to me. Changing my junk filter settings does nothing. Three messages later, I complain to the system administrator. Keep this guy out of my mailbox. Then, like a corny old movie, the mail isn't coming from outside the system. It's inside. I change my email service, enroll with another company. New password, new screen name. I give the address to no one. I wait. The next day, mail from an unknown source. Subject line, why run? Inside, I'm coming, wait for me. Virtually, no pun intended, impossible. How could anyone have followed me unless he worked for both companies, traced my credit card, performed some other electronic wizardry? I cancel my email subscription. Snail mail will have to suffice. Two days later, desperate, reading junk mail, you, I'm coming, may already have won, addressed to me. It knows who I am and where I live. I call the police. They say they will trace the junk mail. However, since no threats have been made, there is little they can do when, if, they locate the perpetrator. I buy a deadbolt for the door, a gun for the bedside table. I read only mail from friends. Then at work, a fax. The red lights on the machine wink and flicker in a way that seems triumphant, or perhaps mocking. I am everywhere. You cannot escape. Printed below the message, something new, a pattern of swirling lines. My heart racing, I hold the paper between shaking fingers. To my fevered imagination, it feels rubbery and oily, almost as if it were organic. The pattern begins to swirl before my eyes. I feel a growing sense of menace. I crumple the paper, throw it away from me. I leave work complaining of sudden illness. At home, I sit in the darkness. I can recall the pattern on the paper. The branches seem to reach out to seize me. I consciously blank it from my mind, try to reestablish normalcy. I make dinner, read a book. That night, I cannot sleep. In dreams, the pattern drifts before me, and I feel that something is about to appear materializing through it. Terrible, blasphemous, cyclopean. A dream echo of mad piping lingers in my ears as I start awake again and again. In the morning, unrested, I go to my ATM. I withdraw the maximum, $300. I go to a hotel, cheap, anonymous. I pay cash, use a false name. I lay down on the bed, holding the gun. When the phone rings, I nearly shoot it in my convulsive leap. The operator states, we have a call from a hearing impaired person for this number. Please wait. Faint clicking noises at the other end. The operator's voice, the message is, look at your automated teller receipt. Would you like to respond? I hang up. The phone rings again, and again, and again. I open my wallet, pull out the receipt folded away without a glance. Printed on it are not account numbers and balances, but a mass of ink, the black swirling lines of last night's dreams. I know then that I cannot go on. The gun seems insufficient, but the hotel's location near the freeway suggests a better solution. I walk out onto the overpass, step up onto the wall. Far away I hear cries, but they mean nothing. I pause a moment, then let myself slip into the abyss. I struggle awake, impossibly. The respirator will not allow me to scream. Drugs cloud my perception. I cannot remember who I am. I open my eyes, see strangely stiff and bulky limbs under a sheet lit with a pale green glow. 
The machines breathe for me, monitor my vital signs, control my medications. They will not let me sleep. They will not let me die. I try not to think of the pattern, like not thinking of a pink elephant. Pain grows, agony worse and worse. The drip of morphine must have malfunctioned, but the machine gives no indication. Nurses come and go, check the tubes and wires that keep me alive, finding nothing unusual. Slowly, the knowledge grows in me, what I have to do to end the pain. Think of the pattern. Open the gate. I fight against the pain as long as I can, resist my calling. But at last, the pattern unfolds in my mind like an obscene blossom opening.